Hi, Jive Dadson here. I'm going to try to explain this business about financial derivatives in 10 minutes. Might not quite make it. Might have to split the video in two. You've been hearing about these things and how they almost uh, caused a worldwide financial collapse last week and the stock market started to crash and there were bank runs and so forth. What's going on? What is a financial derivative? Well, I always start by looking at Wikipedia, all right? That way, if you don't understand the answer, you change it. Derivatives are financial instruments whose value changes in response to the changes in underlying variables. The main types of derivatives are futures, forwards, options, and swaps. I think I will change it. Okay, I'm going to give you um, a couple of real-world examples of things that are like derivatives that you know about. Number one is a horse race, betting slip. This involves a punter, a better, who buys, who's known as the buyer, the seller, which is the track. The buyer puts down his two bucks, and that two bucks induces an obligation on the part of the seller to pay the punter, the buyer, an amount of money if a certain event occurs. Let's say I bet on Old Blue out of shoot number two on the nose. Bet on him to win. Track is obligated to give me an amount of money if that event transpires. And the amount of money they're obligated to give me is based on underlying variables, namely the amount of money that people bet on other horses and the amount of money that other people and myself bet on Old Blue out of shoot number two. Those are the underlying variables. So you've got an event, underlying variables, a seller, and a buyer. Contract with obligations. Pretty simple. The example I just gave you is called a speculation or speculative position. It's a bet that I want to win. There are also bets that you want to lose. An example of that is uh, car insurance. When you buy an insurance policy on your car, you're making a bet with the insurance company, the seller. This bet's called a policy. You either pay for it all at once or in installments, and there are certain events that will cause and trigger the seller to have to give you an amount of money that's based on underlying variables such as what a windshield costs today or the blue book price of the car you totaled. Okay? This is for a, a set amount of time. So that's, that's, those are the uh, components that are generally there in a derivative. Okay. So for a time period, you've got events, you've got underlying variables, a seller and a buyer. Obligations. That's it. Okay. There is one very important difference, however, between the derivatives and the automobile insurance and that's I can't buy a policy on somebody else. Say I know somebody can't drive very well. Let's give him a name. Let's say um, Dave, Davis Fleetwood. I know this guy named Davis Fleetwood. He can't drive. He lives in a cellar in a basement. I figure he can't drive. I want to buy an insurance policy on his car. Insurance company is going to tell me no can do. You have to be the driver. You have to own the car. With financial derivatives, no such restrictions. I can buy what's called a credit default swap where I bet that some bank or some company is going to default on an obligation that they have. In fact, this thing might be itself a credit default swap or a, another derivative. So these things can be layered on top of each other. They call them D squared and D cubed, and they've identified up to four levels of derivatives based on derivatives based on derivatives. So because I can buy, anybody can buy these things, or anybody with enough money, even though they don't own the underlying asset, there's no limit to how many of them can be sold. Just credit default swaps alone that notional value, like you buy a $100,000 in life insurance policy, that $100,000, that's the notional value. The notional value of these credit default swaps alone 
is $63 trillion. And that's only one kind of derivative. So you've got them built on top of each other, and also the counterparties can loop back on each other, with this guy being a counterparty to this guy being a thing that comes back in a loop. So you've got this whole bunch of dominoes that are set up in a labyrinth, and it, the labyrinth feeds back on itself. So what caused some of the dominoes to go unstable? A couple of things. Models and malinvestment. Models and malinvestment. The two M's. Start with models first. The people who sold these derivatives were paid based on bonuses that in turn were based on the nominal profit of the company they were working for. And how do you figure out how much money you've made when you're holding these um, insurance policies, that you've written insurance policies, you have obligations, how much are the obligations, how big a, um, you know, what's, how big a, what's the liability is that obligation? It's hard to say, especially if these kinds of derivatives are not sold in a market where you can say, what's it selling for today? If it's what's called an over-the-counter over the counter derivative, where it's just two people got together and made a deal. So they come up with models. Sort of like buying a handicapping program for figuring out, you know, whether you're going to make a profit by buying a, a ticket on old blue out of shoot number two. It's just a program. It has things, knobs you can tweak. Well, their compensation is based on their profits. The profits nominally are based on these models. The models are also what they use to price the derivatives that they sell, and it's also used to determine how much money they have to keep in order to be protected against, you know, having to the payouts, the call it the reserves, and they have, the people who are selling them have a vested interest in making it look like their um, liabilities are very small. So there's another feedback loop, and a positive feedback loop, like holding the microphone up to the speaker of an amplifier. It can go unstable. So there, that's got them wiggling already. They're trying to make all these profits and they can increase their profits by changing the models and cause them to sell more. The other thing is malinvestment. The first dominoes to fall over were uh, derivatives based on derivatives based on mortgages. People had bought houses for way too much money and the reason they did this original, well, there were laws that were passed by Carter and Clinton that, that virtually forced the banks to give mortgages to people who couldn't afford them. And then along comes Alan Green. That really didn't work too well. Not to, there weren't all that many sold that way. But then along comes Alan Greenspan. After the dot-com bu bubble, uh, lowered interest rates with the Federal Reserve manipulating the market to drive interest rates lower and he not not only did that but he encouraged people to buy houses with mortgages called um, arms adjustable rate mortgages where their payments could go up later he actually told him this is a good thing to do after he driven interest rates very low and that caused lots of people to go into the market buy houses and the price of the houses went way, way up, far, far above, from maybe two or three times what they n normally would cost, and that's malinvestment. Well, the malinvestment feeds back into the models. There's another feedback loop, because the models were based on historic default rates on mortgages, and they were based on these houses being worth what they were selling for on the market, which they weren't. So, particularly when the option arms and these adjustable rate mortgages started hitting, people started defaulting on the mortgages, and that pushed the first domino. There are lots more dominoes that are teetering. Peace.